Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. We are just going to uh, short of six. So, just an informal. How's the lockdown going out in Delhi? <laughs> I am very much in uh, Chandigarh, which is uh, the finest place for a lockdown. <laughs> no doubt about it. So th this shows the true lockdown, <laughs> despite the fact that both of us are in Chandigarh, but we haven't caught up. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and the fact that the Chaudhary has been kept in his house shows that the lockdown is actually serious. <laughs> no, it's uh, an occasion to learn many new things. The video conferencing in our, uh, I think, legal system, the legal conferencing, the video conferencing is an absolute revolution. It has changed the dynamics of the game completely. And uh, that is making wonders, I think. That's true. So it's uh, 6 o'clock. Just before I formally ask you to take the entire stage, just a mm -hmm. few words. Once the case is registered under the PMLA, the one fact which flow goes in everyone's mind, including the family and the friends, is that he his linen is the most dirtiest. Mm -hmm. And once it is a case registered under the PMLA, that means you, you have to prevent the, the government intent is that that money laundering, which was intended to be clean, shouldn't be clean. But once that F, he, case is registered, one name which immediately strikes down that the dirtiest linen which has come in the market could only be cleaned by Vikram Chaudhary in all over India. No, He's no, a name, no, no. <laughs> one of the names, sir, I'm, I'm not saying one of the names immediately which strikes down. The fact that large number of participants are entering, they want to learn the tricks of the trade, they want to learn the act. How can they also get the person who's under whose name is registered under this case? How should it come out cleanest? You can be safe, safely said that you are the surf excel for anybody whose name is registered. Not at all. Not at all. And just a student like all of us are. And uh, the law is ever evolving. But uh, well, uh, before we start or begin on any anything, let's pose let me pose a question to all of us and let us imagine what if we were to put all our hard earned money into say buying a home we take a home loan also we borrow from our friends we borrow from our family we also make a due diligence we also take route to due diligence check the title of the property and eventually after a year or months it is found that the person from whom we purchased is facing some kind of uh, prosecution or is being hounded by some kind of investigate, investigating agencies. And that that property which he had purchased, the seller, was a proceed of crime. Now, what will happen is that bona fide purchasers, like any of us, are today being hounded. They are being subjected to investigation. and the properties are being attached. In this kind of scenario, the importance of this act is not only for the lawyers or legal fraternity or the courts, the investigating agencies, but it is for every common man. So the act has multiple dimensions. This legislation is affecting everyone in his daily life. And it is uh, said, often said that the true Justice is served only when those who are unaffected are also outraged, are also as outraged as the others. So in, with this perspective in light, first let me have the opportunity to thank you all. It is a great forum. It's a new invention. As I said, lockdown has brought down, uh, has uh, resulted in many, many uh, good thing, things and good beginnings. And kudos to you, your team, CLC is doing a fantastic job. And uh, I, uh, having been invited here, no doubt it's a, a great honor. But at the same time, I must say that people sitting here may be much brighter, may have much more knowledge. This act is so intricate that no one can solve this uh, jingle. Even the best of the, uh, I would say, judicial pronouncements have not so far. There have been dichotomous judgments on various issues. There, is, there are conflicting opinions. There are references all around. So the act requires still, it's a state of evolution. 
and we are all part of this evolution so far as money laundering is concerned. With this uh, note in mind. Uh, so uh, the stage is all yours, but before we start, the fact that you are popular can be shown that we have the highest participants so far on our platform. Congratulations to you for this. No, 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 no congratulations. Congratulations to you. No, the fact, I, I'm not problem. saying <laughs> the fact that you are a be, one of the good best lawyers, number one. Number two, the fact that the people say, believe that you can make them understand better what the books cannot teach them. They say no, the books are the best friends. I but hope friend, that. But the friend in the shape of Vikram Chaudhary couldn't be a better way to express it. So kind of you, I am uh, too enamored. These in, I may not be the worthy recipient of such great uh, 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 remarks as you have said about me, but at the same time, let me say that each one of the participants here, uh, I feel uh, that... So, uh, Chaudhary, I'm sorry to bother you. People are saying, at least I am able to hear it, but some people are saying you are not slightly audible. Could you ask somebody from your side to put the speaker closer to you? See, I'm on a desktop. Am I better audible now? <laughs> uh, I will just ask. Uh, persons can post it on the chat box. Yes. Yes, we okay. have written better. Yes, okay. that's fine. So, uh, well, uh, let me give uh, my two cents on uh, PMLA in this quick uh, uh, session uh, which we have. This subject is so vast that even a basic hearing in a court on a single simple miscellaneous issue can last for days together. So to have a quick roundup as uh, uh, the way I perceive it, let me put it across to you. I started with that example that we have bought a property, a bona fide property purchase, but unfortunately the person from whom we purchased is subsequently found that he was having those as proceeds of crime. So therefore it will affect everyone in the society. Uh, so so we actually, I'm sorry to bother you. If you actually believe that uh, 50 minutes be, would be too short, we can dispense with the Q&A. We can catch you up on some other time. Uh, the no, game would be no, yours. Not at all. I, I am not, uh, a, uh, you know, I would not be a proponent to give any kind of a lecture. because no, I said, not, a, not a lecture. I'm saying mm -hmm. if you believe that the, uh, if the bail application, you believe that 50 minutes is uh, <laughs> not sufficient. So no. just to have a bird eye view also, if you, I, I then feel that one and a half hour would be short. So you can take the stage. It's all, all yours. When you want to mm -hmm. tell, we can post the Q&A just five so minutes back. Let me be very brief and pertinent. And uh, let me not uh, take uh, a dilatory route. And let me say that uh, whatever I will speak today, first of all, you have chosen a person who is uh, obviously on the defense side, so it is always, uh, the view is a bit clouded. I will try to be as objective as possible. But at, I also must say that uh, since law is at the stage of evolution and our foremost duty is towards the evolution of law and uh, the principles of justice, they should be uniform. So to that extent, let me share my thought process. Now, as I see it, first let's, uh, I was, uh, and all my, uh, the, all the views that I will share today would be based upon my personal experience in nothing else, as a professional counsel in all these cases. So let me say that I was having a discussion with someone at one point of time, and uh, it, uh, it came to my notice that money laundering is a term which is associated with laundromats. They used to be in US in 20s and 30s. Uh, Laundromats used to be the front for cleaning the, you know, money or a kind of a dirty money which you would earn by bootlegging, by extortion, by gambling, prostitution, and then since that was cash money, the so laundromat is kind of a, a a pay service where you go, you get your clothes uh, cleaned, dried, and you pay for them, and those payments are mostly in cash. So they were merely a front for those people. So laundromat gave rise to the term as money laundering. But the first time it came to actual effective use was in 70s and 80s after that Watergate scandal in the US and uh, uh, the enactment of a money laundering act in US in 1986. Well, India also has been uh, uh, catching up with the, uh, with the nuances of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, under the ages of United Nations uh, uh, resolutions which have been passed from time to time, including the foremost resolution in 1988, which related to 
the uh, NDPS Act, the United Nations Conventions on Prevention of Illicit Traffic in NDPS Act. And basic origin of money laundering was the that bootlegging and gambling got qualified into a higher degree. And you had then the narcotic trade all over the world, which was ruining not only the economies, but had uh, multiple dimensions. So because of that, the NDPS Act conventions which, to which UN, uh, the uh, UN convention to which uh, India is one of the signatory, India had already enacted in 1985 the NDPS Act. So in, nine, in uh, 1991, India brought in Chapter 5A of the present NDPS Act for four features of properties, which are called illegally acquired properties. So they were also brought in under the Act itself so that the properties could be acquired, could be confiscated, and the, uh, these kind of persons should be paralyzed. And they not only suffer imprisonment, but the properties are also attached and confiscated. Eventually, interestingly, India was having some kind of a, a dichotomy in its approach. There was a time when FERA, Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, which was enacted way back in 73, that was being repealed. So in 99, it was repealed and it was replaced with a much milder and softer FEMA, Foreign Exchange Management Act. So regulation was changed to management. The criminal offenses under FERA went away. FEMA came in with much civil penalties. It was uh, only now left uh, to uh, you know, manage the uh, foreign exchange so that there is liberalization. There are no penal uh, offenses contemplated under FEMA. And ED, the Enforcement Directorate, as we know of today, was a creation of earlier the FARA statute and subsequently FAMA. So Enforcement Directorate is a, a body constituted statutorily now under the Foreign Exchange Management Act. So in terms of the international covenants and conventions within, to which India is a signatory, eventually they also framed a Money Laundering Act, which was in 2002, but got the president's assent only in January 2003. When the act came, I must say that there is some kind of a paradigm shift here. It was NDA government at that time. But the act was not enforced. It was enforced eventually under the UPA regime in July 2005, 1st of July 2005. And when the act came into force, the act did not say that enforcement directorate would be the authority to investigate. It only said that there would be authorities which would be notified by the government, which would be appointed. And under section 54 of the act, interestingly, all other authorities were obliged to assist the authorities under the act for implementation of the act. And those authorities are mentioned in section 54, which includes, say, for example, police, which say the other DRI, et cetera. And but at the same time, Enforcement Directorate is also mentioned as one of the agencies which was to assist the authorities under the Act to implement the provisions of the Act. But on 1st July 2005, when the Act came into force, notifications were issued and Enforcement Directorate officials in their capacity as Director, etc., and Assistant Director, Deputy Director, etc., were also appointed as authorities under the Act. So they were notified under the Act. The act when it came, it's a very unique act and a very, it's an unprecedented kind of a, uh, an enactment which says that there has to be commission of an offense which is called a predicate offense. And this is the uh, threshold all over the world. If you see the UK law, which is of 2002, the Proceeds of Crime Act or the US law, they've undergone many changes, but this threshold is common that there has to be a commission of a predicate offense or an activity, criminal activity relating to a predicate offense from which some proceeds of crime are generated. Those proceeds of crime are then projected as untainted and therefore it becomes money laundering. So the criminal activity relating to a scheduled or predicate offense was must. Now those predicate offense under the PMLA were kept in a schedule. And at that time, when the act came into force, it only had very few offenses. 
there were NDPS and probably two offences under the IPC. They were considered to be serious offences. So NDPS and those two penal code offences were the only offences which were part of the schedule. But as the time progressed in 2009 and subsequently in 2012-13, there was drastic amendments to the Act that, and uh, many offences under the IPC, PCA Act, and you have a host of other offenses. Today we have part A, part B, part C. There are three parts, and part A is essentially the, uh, the most, uh, I would say, populated part of uh, the schedule, which contains most of the offenses. And those offenses which were in part B, where the threshold was, at that time there was a threshold that a minimum threshold of 30 lakhs is required to come within the purview of money laundering. So those part B offenses were moved to part A. Well, this is all. A debate which is, uh, I think, a milestone judgment of the Supreme Court in uh, Nikesh Tarachan Shah, to which I was fortunate to be a part of the assisting team, where the issue was whether the conditions under the PMLA for release on bail, they were stringent conditions, they are good or they should be stuck down. And while interpreting the provisions of the Act, the Supreme Court clarified on three aspects. One, that proceeds of crime must relate to criminal activity relating to a predicate offense, and that in order to constitute the offense of money laundering, the property or the money or whatever is derived the, 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 as proceeds of crime must be shown or projected as untainted. Now, that's the litmus test. So unless it was projected as untainted, it won't become money laundering. So with these two interpretations, the Supreme Court eventually went on. Of course, it's a historical judgment and every lawyer in this country knows about it. And it has now been repeatedly cited all across that the conditions were held to be unconstitutional. They were held to be not, uh, they were held to be manifestly arbitrary. It was held that they were not, there were no compelling circumstances under the Act which would uh, entitle the state, state to impose such rigorous conditions. Now, eventually, after that judgment, and in fact, before that, when the law, when the uh, matter reached the Supreme Court in uh, that Nikesh Tarachan Shah's famous case, there has been some kind of a debate as to what eventually is proceeds of crime. Now, proceeds of crime, section, the definition in section 21U, it has two different facets. It says that once you have entered into some kind of criminal activity relating to a predicate or a scheduled offense under the PMLA, you have generated some money or property. Either you have it, that is proceed of crime, or the value of such property. So, word used is value. The second facet is if the property is not available here or it is placed somewhere else abroad, if it is placed abroad, then you have the equivalent value of such property. So, two expressions were used in section 21U. One was value, and the second was equivalent value. This Second aspect in section three was, there were two words used for section three. Section three is the offense of money laundering, which said that you have proceeds of crime, but you have to be knowingly or actually involved. And then there were disjunctives all there. You are knowingly assisting, actually involved in the process or activity connected with proceeds of crime. And then there was a conjunction. After all those disjunctive ors, there was a conjunctive and, which said that and project it or claim it as untainted. Now, as I said, the act has undergone, and I think about 11 amendments till date. The recent amendment has added some kind of explanations to both section 21U as well as to section 3. Now, Nikesh, as I said, Supreme Court in 2018 interpreted that projection or claiming it as untainted is very necessary. And unless you claim it as untainted money, you cannot 
the, the activity cannot constitute the offense of money laundering. But if we go by the explanation now, even if you don't project or claim it as untainted, it will become money laundering still. And instead of those disjunctive odds where there was knowingly or actual involvement, which necessarily requires under the criminal law mens rea or the criminal intent, they have been done away with it. And it seems that now that word knowingly will have to be interpreted in a different way. We all know that explanations are actually not amendments to the section. They are like something was amiss, something needed to be explained, something needed to be clarified. And therefore, explanations were brought in. But if these explanations, to some extent, and I'll come to some of the explanations later, there are explanations to section 45 and 44 also that those explanations are in fact giving a totally new dimension to the act. Today as we sit, well, I think we are not in any adversarial mode here. There would be students of law, there would be officers of the court, there would be officers of the state, and we are all concerned with the proper implementation of the act. Now I will divide my understanding of the act into three different portions, and two are primarily with, as lawyers, we are all engaged. The first is the arrest, investigation, arrest and prosecution under the Act. The second part is the attachment and confiscation of properties under the Act. And the third is the obligation on the banks and other financial institutions regarding uh, reporting as reporting entities, etc. The intermediaries, which are like the stock, uh, stock exchange, etc. for reporting. The first two aspects which are essential as to what constitutes, uh, I mean, what drives uh, the arrest and investigation. Now, investigation, as I said, 2005, it came into being under a new government. And when it came, the government felt that the provisions require some kind of tinkering, that there is difficulty, the word exactly used in the amendment was, there was difficulty in implementation of the provisions of the Act. And what did they do away with was to, ex to delete, omit section 45.1a, which existed prior to the enforcement of this act and which said that all offenses under this act are cognizable. So they deleted that, omitted that, and also introduced uh, another uh, proviso in section 45, which said that well, no police officer will investigate. So the aim was that the offenses are to be made Apparently, which we also rely on some debates of Lok Sabha, etc., which said that the offenses were to be made non cognizant So the offenses were, though the title heading still remained as cognizable and non bailable but that specific provision was taken up. Now, the raging debate, one of the areas of debate in this country today, all across various high courts, and various high courts have taken different views, is that the offense is cognizable or non-cognizable. And if it is cognizable, it will have a procedure to follow and uh, a different procedure to follow. If it is non-cognizable, a different procedure to follow. And procedure is all under chapter 12 of the CRPC, the Criminal Procedure Code. The Criminal Procedure Code, as we all know, is the mother parent. And it applies to all investigations, whether under the I, for offenses under the IPC or the offenses under special laws. Unless a special law has a procedure which is contrary to the CRPC, the CRPC will prevail. Now, one of the raging debates in the country is whether the CRPC is obscured or taken away by some special procedure under the PMLA for investigating an offense. Now, the horse, the debate, irrespective of the debate, whether the offense is cognizable or non-cognizable, both the expressions are not defined under PMLA. Whether there is any procedure under the PMLA specifically assigned. So there is one of the areas of debate is that there is no procedure under PMLA. Therefore, CRPC will have to follow. And if we go by the adage that it is non-cognizable, then you will have to follow Section 155 CRPC, which says that you have to take a permission from the magistrate before commencing investigation. You will have to take a warrant of arrest before arresting anyone. And if it is cognizable, which the government has now brought in a 2019 amendment, and they have again explained 
that well all offenses are cognizable so if the offenses are cognizable then the first and foremost parameter of a cognizable offense is that you register a case which is called they are already registering something called as ecir an enforcement case information report now if they register that report the ecir then if they follow 154 the ecir would have to be sent to the court concerned within under 157 there is an obligation cast that you have to transmit the copy of the fir or the information report to the court concerned it will become a public document it will have to be uploaded by virtue of a judgment of the supreme court that whenever you register some case you have to upload it on the website and the moment the case is registered the person becomes an accused there is a constitution bench judgment which says that the moment fir is registered a person becomes an accused so if he becomes an accused then there is some very interesting feature which is coupled with section 50 of the act section 50 now is a very unique provision and it says that the an office authority under the act would have a power to summon the person call upon him that will be a judicial proceeding in terms of section 193 and 228 of the penal code which is that it will be perjury you will have to speak the truth and it will be perjury if you don't speak because it's equivalent to a judicial proceeding now at the and on the one hand person becomes an accused if it is a cognizable case and had the case been registered on the other hand he will have to speak the truth there is a provision in article 20 article 20 of the constitution is a fundamental right it is in part 3 of the constitution Article twenty has three facets, and the third facet of Article twenty is that you have a right. Every person in this country, every citizen of this country, has a right not to self-incriminate himself, a right to remain silent. So, how do you reconcile with a person who is accused and who has a right to remain silent under Article twenty three, twenty clause three? he has no is now obliged under section 50 to speak truth and if he does not he is though he may be subjecting himself to a criminal charge by stating something but if he does not speak it will amount to perjury so this is another area of you no know, debate and as why i use the word debate because the matters are subjudice they are pending before the highest court of the country also this apex court is seized of the matters and there are different schools of thought also that that have come up there was a school of thought earlier and why i say earlier is under the customs act regime under the customs act the supreme court constitution benches maybe three of them if i correctly remember have dilated on the subject delved deep into it and said that under the customs act making a statement to a officer under 108 is not equivalent of making a statement to a police officer it is not hit by section 25 of the evidence act it is not violative of article 20 clause 3 the protection now there was a reason behind it and the reason was that the offenses under the customs act at that time when those constitution benches judgments came they were all non cognizable so in a non cognizable case you do not become an accused until the authority goes and files a complaint in a court of law complaint as it is, as is understood under section 2d of the crpc complaint as is understood under chapter 15 of the crpc section 200 so unless you file a complaint you don't become an accused you are not an accused on the day when you were summoned based the question of any constitutional protection so whether those judgments in non cognizable regime would be applicable now and especially with the nuances of pmla where a person may well be an accused already in a schedule or a predicate offense and he is being called by a different agency to stay under crpc interestingly there is section 161 now 161 gives power to a police officer to call a person that you are bound to come and assist the investigating officer for the case and under 161 sub section 2 interestingly he is also obliged to state the truth but there is a disclaimer there is an exception there that to that extent you will not be asked to state which may subject to a you to a criminal charge 
Now, this is in consonance with the guarantee, constitutional guarantee under Article 20. But now this guarantee is missing under Section 50. So there is some kind of reconciliation which has to take place and the there has to be a line which will have to be drawn. Some character meaning has to be given. As I said, we are all part of this evolution. When we talk of CRPC, when we talk of IPC, when we talk of some established offenses like the earlier uh, uh, cases like uh, maybe food adulteration, maybe drugs and cosmetics, maybe customs act, the old provisions, they have a settled position of law. But here, the law is ever evolving. And as I sit uh, in this forum today with all of you, all that which we have challenged in different courts and different forums, all that which is subject matter of uh, adjudication pending, I would say adjudication, the government that is simultaneously has been bringing one amendment after the other. Now those Vikram ji, hello, hello, Yes, I'm back. I think everybody can hear me now. Yes, well, let me continue. So there have been incessant amendments on every issue, which with the uh, greatest humility and respect, I will say that those amendments are adding chaos to the confusion. Now, those amendments would only end up in further litigation. Let me dwell on a bit more about the investigation and arrest aspects. The act was specially coined with an abhorrence to arrest. The act was not brought in to arrest merely on suspicion. So arrest was taken to a very high pedestal in section 19 of the act, which provided two essential safeguards and those are very unique one as a student of law one would not find such drastic safeguards in any other enactment it says that you cannot arrest a person unless you have a material in your possession have reasons to believe based upon material in your possession and what should be the material in your possession that the person is guilty of the offense so at the threshold you should have a very sterling quality case a case of an extremely sterling character, which would demonstrate that the person is guilty, only then you can arrest. So with that yardstick in mind, the second safeguard which was coined in section 19 of the act was that you will communicate, you will deduce your, uh, uh, the uh, reasons to believe in writing and you will, uh, the essential, I would say concomitant of this safeguard is that if you have to, reduce your grounds of arrest in writing, grounds of arrest in writing, then the grounds of arrest have to be communicated. Now there is essentially a dichotomy prevailing in the stand of the authority under the act, which presently is of course the enforcement director. There is some kind of a dichotomy. They go in a case of Bombay, they communicate the grounds of arrest to a person in writing. In Delhi, they say we are not obliged to communicate the grounds of arrest. Now this situation, has led to an impasse, impasse and deadlock. There has been rampant, uh, I would say, uh, petitions on this very issue. And there has been dichotomy of judgments too. The last one being to which I happen to be a party was in Delhi High Court, in which the Delhi High Court held three things. One, the directorate, directorate is obliged to follow the procedure. Under Chapter 12 of CRPC, they cannot do away with that. 
to they have to formally communicate the grounds of arrest and furnish the copy to a person when he is arrested and also dwelt on the aspect of section 19 the judgment is now taken to the supreme court of india the matter is sub judice there is no stay yes there are contrary views taken by bombay high court taken by punjab haryana high court those contrary views have been held in that very judgment to be parinkurium or not a good law so the raging debate as i said is pending in the still pending a final decision of the apex court on these crucial aspects which govern the personal liberty of a person the other aspect which is equally important is transparency now what is the transparency a person will never know that uh, there is uh, an eci uh, happening so sorry to bother yes uh, just tell the name meanwhile the team can post the citation only the, 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 the delhi judgment whatever judgment you are referring just give the name the team will post the citation of that judgment correct so uh, in any case is wherever we are, Bhushan, we are we are referring that yes raj bhushan om prakash dikshit is the judgment it's a celebrated judgment by a division bench headed by my lord justice uh, murli dhar a very eloquent judgment on the subject and the matter is now as i said pending before the supreme court that's a batch of matters in which that matter is now also now pending now there is element of transparency which was i was referring to which is very important as we all know sunlight is the best disinfectant now there is no transparency there is no record there is no eci are available at for anybody to access if somebody thinks that his liberty is being invaded he could go and file uh, an anticipatory will not to be not to happen now i am not a lawyer i am not any anything to do with this field of law i am an ordinary layman i am an ordinary businessman and i am an ordinary citizen of this country i am going to buy a property if i go and buy a property what will i do i will check the title of the property fine no problem with the title no encumbrance over the property it is not under any mortgage any lien the title is clean i go and buy the property i put all my investment into it i take even a home loan to do it but subsequently it is found that well the person may be have been facing or may be subsequently facing some investigation and it is claimed that this property is proceeds of crime so where is the transparency if these properties are to be attached then there may be something has to be evolved that no property can sale or purchase of a property in this country can take place unless there is some kind of a ratification by the enforcement directorate that the property is clean you may go and buy it these kind of things and there are myriad examples i can throw examples one after the other there are live cases uh, a few of them are one of the leading cases um, in bombay i would say where the unknown uh, unknown criminal of this country who is no more now named ikbal mirchi has created properties or he indulged in many offenses he was implicated in many cases and those cases are of 90s maybe the man is no more now after the act, pmla act came into being in uh, 2005 those were before that the pmla proceedings have not been initiated there is no predicate offense there is no scheduled offense at present live there is no finding recorded in any scheduled offense that there was some proceeds of crime generated there is absolute chaos and confusion now that case would i think would be a burning case which would also be expounding further law on the subject will be ever evolving we have a very recent judgment called seema gal by the punjab and haryana high court and i think this is one of the uh, one of the i would say a virtually a treatise on the subject it is an encyclopedia and the thought process is very engrossing in that case punjab haryana high court has held now which is i think the most reasonable a common man interpretation and which is that the word value occurring in proceeds of crime can only be the value of the actual proceeds of crime so if i say for example mr x duped somebody of rupees 10 lakhs and that 10 lakhs say he buys a car so that's the value 
So 10 lakhs is not available, but car is available, you go and attach the car. But if the car is also not available, that 10 lakhs has been dissipated, finished, he consumed anywhere, nothing is left, then you cannot go and attach any of his safe property which was purchased maybe in 80s, 90s or ancestral property which may have come to, uh, you know, uh, come to him as heritage. So this cannot be the ambit of law. Equivalent value and value have been given very eloquent meaning and character in this recent pronouncement. That's the way the act will have to be construed so that the interest of the society is balanced, so that the act does not become an instrument of oppression or an instrument of misuse. We have to give it a definite character and meaning and pause somewhere. Of course, that view will also be subject matter of challenge and there is a contrary view by the Delhi High Court to an extent in Axis Bank's case. And of course, Axis Bank's judgment is pending before the Supreme Court. The second facet which is connected is the property attachment and property confiscation. Now the Act contemplates that provisional attachment of the property at the outset. Now Section 5 of the Act had a definite connect character to it. It said that first, you should be clear that there are proceeds of crime in this case. And second, the officer should have definite belief that the property is going to be, be dispensed with, it is going to be uh, disposed of, alienated, so as to frustrate the proceedings under the Act. So these were the two yardsticks on which provisional attachment of property could take place. Now, the property may have been encumbered already with the bank. They have lien over it. It cannot be alienated. The property may have been attached under other proceedings. Say, for example, the famous drug case in Punjab, the famous Bhola drug scam or whatever drug case we call it. In that case, properties were already attached of most of the persons under the NDPS Act, as I said, Chapter 5A. But still, Section 5 proceedings were invoked by the authority. So therefore, that is another subject matter of debate. Second, Section 5 had an essential safeguard. And it eventually linked the investigation under PMLA to the scheduled offense investigation. And what was that? It was that unless a charge sheet is filed or a complaint is filed, in the main predicate offense. Now, who is investigating predicate offense? Obviously, it is not the authority under the Act. It is not the enforcement directorate. It is some other agency. It may be police, it may be CBI, it may be any agency. Now, those may be investigating. They have to file a charge sheet. For so why? Purpose is that they identify proceeds of crime. Otherwise, there was no purpose, no meaning in keeping this prerequisite of filing of a charge sheet. Then there was a second proviso, there is a second proviso, which is also subject matter of challenge, which is that you can go away with the first proviso of that prerequisite of filing of a charge sheet, and you can still attach the property, but you will have to again record reasons that unless it is attached immediately, that there is some grave emergency, unless attached immediately, the property is going to be alienated. So you dispense with the requirement of filing of charge sheet. So eventually, with this, Second proviso interpretation is still pending. That's also an area which is uh, uh, there's something uh, leading judgment for Jay Saker's case. And I happen to be associated with that case as well, where the Delhi High Court took a view that, well, second proviso is constitutional, it is valid. But on other aspects as to the reason to believe, etc., it gave a befitting uh, a ruling. And that judgment is taken to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has stayed the operation of that judgment. But as I said, the latest Punjab and Hena High Court and that Axis Bank of Delhi High Court, they are interesting, uh, they make a very interesting reading. The other aspect of the attachment relating to provisional attachment of property is something very, 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 uh, I would say, diverse in nature. So how it is diverse? So provisional attachment takes place for a period of 30 days only. Within 30 days, the officer will go and file a complaint before somebody called as an adjudicating authority and there is only one, which is in New Delhi. So you go to an adjudicating authority, file a complaint within 30 days. Now that adjudicating authority has a different yardstick. It will issue notice only if it finds one, that 
there is money laundering now the element of money laundering is introduced so proceeds of crime or money laundering it will issue notice so it is it can't just issue notice without having reasons to believe as reflected as required under section 81 of the act so you have to issue notice and if it no notice is issued the time period will get extended it will go to 180 days now 180 days is the time period in which the property can be confirmed attachment provisional attachment as i say can be confirmed or not now under 83 then the authority can confirm the attachment and it has to now record that the property is involved in money laundering so money laundering this is the requirement of section 83 now if money laundering term as we see the definition under the act it is the offense of money laundering so an adjudicating authority has to actually opine that there is actually offense of money laundering for the purpose of provisionally attaching the property now this property will remain attached if it is confirmed and if maximum period is 365 days if the investigation remains pending but if the criminal complaint case is filed which is a criminal complaint under the for prosecution of the for the offences under pmla then the forum shifts so first there was an authority the uh, the officer of uh, the directorate who will make a provisional attachment then there will be an adjudicating authority which will confirm that attachment and then eventually the case will travel to a criminal court which will try the pre pml offence and at the culmination of the trial will opine whether the pro whether either the offence is committed or the property is involved in money laundering or not and if it holds that property is involved in money laundering then it will order confiscation now three variants have stepped in in the field of uh, attachment you have a provisional attachment you have a confirmed provisional attachment and then you may have a final process of confiscation but then there was a provision there is a provision which says that the authority can take possession upon confirmation that is a 84 so you can take forthwith possession and there are rules now framed in 2030 which allow an authority to actually enter your premises and take possession of the property which is only provisional attachment and only provisionally confirmed the trial may take n number of years it may takes long time but the property possession can be taken off now there was in fact a judgment of the madras high court and subsequent was well uh, uh, different uh, uh, judgments uh, of the same high court as well which said that you cannot take physical possession it is only symbolic possession but now physical possession is being taken so rules are under challenge those are also cases of evolution as i started my whole subject today was that whatever we debate on this act or whatever we discuss about this act is there is no finality this these are matters which are in the domain of yet at an ascent stage and we are all process uh, we in the process of evolution of this law and part of the this historic evolution so the act will have to go many uh, tongs and hammers before it becomes uh, a piece of legislation which is acceptable that there are some standard parameters the debate will not be concluded i think uh, i would be running out of uh, more time till i you know uh, just wrap it up so as i said twin conditions i had started that nikesh's case the bail rigorous rigorous conditions were now taken away dispensed with but the government took came with some amendment in 2018 itself and with that amendment they introduced some words but they did not introduce the twin conditions back the law is that once the constitutional court like the supreme court of india declares a provision to be ultra vires then it is presumed that the provision never existed on the statute book but it cannot be resurrected by any implication if it has to be resurrected reintroduced then there has to be specific reintroduction but even if we read a bare act today published by either professionals universals or anybody the bare act will still contain a provision that there are that those twin conditions are reiterated so this issue also engaged the attention of bombay high court in samir bujbal's case the bombay high court emphatically said that well these twin conditions have never been revived but we see in every other case the twin conditions are employed by the by the union and it is often argued that well they are enforced
So this is another area which is conflicting. Relating to the, the aspect of uh, attachment again, coming to the attachment part again. Now under the attachment provisions, if there is one very interesting aspect, which is that now with the recent amendment, they have introduced that earlier the entire the property would vest with the central government completely. Now yeah, they have given some right that if you have legitimate interest in the property, you can come at and come up and claim. Now this legitimate interest again is a matter of interpretation. Why? Because supposing a bank has offered someone a loan, and that loan was given by connivance of a bank official who will misuse or abuse this position. Now bank officer is involved, but it's bank's interest at stake. So bank has a legitimate interest in that property, which is actually maybe lien, encumbered or mortgaged, but it has claim over the property. Now can that claim be denied because your official was involved? So these are also raging debates and that's exactly the excess bank's case that the property was procured actually much earlier and it can't be the proceeds of crime. So this is one of the raging debates. Second is the insolvency banking uh, bankruptcy code of 2016. Now that's a very interesting debate in the country. Now, IBC 2016 was aimed at restructuring, re-establishing the company which is called a corporate debtor. And there were financial and operational, there are financial and operational creditors under that act. Now, there is some kind of a amendment in the act in the IBC 2016, which says that, well, there would be some kind of supremacy or protection immunity is given to the corporate debtor, debtor, that if there is some resolution process underway, it is resolved then corporate debtor will be absolved of any action under any other law. Yes, a person who was a partner, director, etc., would still remain uh, responsible. But now, whether IBC prevails over uh, PMLA or PMLA prevails over IBC, because both have a non abstentive clause of overriding effect. Now, if there's an overriding effect, whether a later statute prevails, a former statute prevails, that debate has also traveled to the Supreme Court of India. So the matters are still subjudiced. There also it's a state of flux. We coming back to the last limb of this. Whether there could be, as I said, different yardsticks or different standards by the same authority. As I said, they give reasons to believe in a given case. They don't give reasons to believe in a given case, say for attachment of property. They don't communicate grounds of arrest in a given case, they communicate grounds of arrest in a given case. For all investigating agency in the country, let me quote two of them, the premier ones, the Central Bureau of Investigation. They are, there is something called as a CBI manual, which is recognized and which is said that manual is binding on CBI. There is something called as a customs manual for Customs Act investigations by investigating agencies like DRI, Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, etc. They follow their customs manual and they are bound by it. Now, what is so confidential or secret about a PMLA manual? Now, that manual exists that has come during the hearing of proceedings before a particular case. But the manual is not in public domain. So all these conflicting questions are have arisen. Today we are sitting in a non-adversarial forum. We can all Today, there is a stage for taking action, taking it to a resolve. I must compliment our investigating agency, which is Enforcement Directorate. It's a very complex case. The PMLA cases all across are complex. As they say, it's placement, there is layering, and there is integration. That's how three different layers of uh, uh, processes of uh, money laundering. It's a very complicated process. There are engineered devices. People are very wicked, people are vicious. That may be so. And all credit that these are very, very, there are web of transactions which have to be worked out. But at the same time, we cannot allow ourselves to sway into, a, into those kind of absurdities where investigating agency is questioned at every step. That should not be. We, they should inspire confidence. They should come up with something which is very transparent, which is very clean, which leaves little scope of doubt, where every innocent is not being brought in within the purview of the act. The moment somebody gets a notice from ED, it's like uh, 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 the world crashing down. It should not be reflected like that, that 
powers vested under the act must be acted in a transparent and extremely fair manner and that is what the need of the hour is in fact it is said that numerous laws project that there is some kind of numerous anomalies there are numerous amendments coming in this act today there is something very interesting a fugitive economic offenders act has been brought in now under the fugitive economic offenders act also pmla is a scheduled offense there and attachment of property is there and its proceeds of crime as are almost identically defined as pmla act now what will happen property is attached under pml property can be attached under feo same property same property is already attached here under ndps act there will be complete dichotomy this dichotomy has to be resolved and there is some kind of transparency which we expect which must happen i must uh, uh, i must uh, uh, quote some of the finest jurists in the course of uh, the hearings of these kind of cases that um, uh, that famous uh, shakespeare quote that in the pursuit of justice let none of us seek salvation so there would be no salvation here all this is a growing concept many dynamics each and every provision as i said that uh, requires uh, uh, you know a debate and discussion uh, on even the minutest of the aspects i don't know how much time i'm left with because <laughs> Uh, say so it's all your time we, uh, uh, the blissful part would be that uh, it is one of the engro most engrossing sessions the ecg lines goes up and down but in your case it's totally flat and no, for the first no. time the ecg line people are cherishing that no no answer. otherwise the flat one, line shows that the person is dead the one, people are one, cherishing it for the first time the one uh, maybe the last aspect which i i and then i will leave to you to if there is any any kind of a interaction here One is Section 44, which I have not touched so far. Now, Nikesh's judgment in Supreme Court also said that there is an in interlinked, I would say, intertwined, interlinked, and interconnection between. Uh, the... I am sorry to bother. Since uh, some people have posted judgments, the Q and A section would be on. Therefore, if anybody has posted the question, he can uh, post it again. That will yeah. be taken in accordance with the priority. But yeah. uh, 7:30 would be the last time. Therefore, no further questions be posted on the group. thank you sir so we can take the questions or shall i no sir you complete it otherwise mm -hmm. half based story would be just like abhimanyu we shouldn't right. become uh, take you from mm -hmm. the mahabharat let's right. complete the entire story now section 44 was drastically now this is section 44 is i would say the ambli call ambli call cord connect between the pmla and the its predicate offense so somewhere the impression is being gathered and by way of amendments as has been done in section 44 also what is section 44 it is that if the trial of a scheduled offense has to go along with the offense under the pml now there are this provision was interpreted in nikesh only and it was said that the ambit of this provision is that both offenses should be tried together why because proceeds of crime are to be identified in the scheduled offense case and then the laundering thereof would be seen by the investigating agency under pml now this growing feeling that assuming that say mr x has duped somebody of rupees 10 lakhs he claims that he has cheated the main investigating agency finds the police that there is no cheating and it goes and files a closure report but at the same time pml investigations have also begun now they claim that sorry we are not going to close we will still continue with the offense now this is one very major area of conflict so what has to be some kind of a balanced coordination if the whole substratum of the case is gone which is the scheduled predicate offense or if the predicate offense says that nothing is generated from it that there are no proceeds of crime it may hold somebody guilty there are many offenses in this under the schedule to the pmla from which maybe no money is generated somebody commits a murder just in a rage of passion that can't be said that there is some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, laundry so you have the some kind of proceeds of crime generated so if there is no proceeds of crime generated there is a closure report filed where is the question of proceeding with the pmla case so they must be joined together we have classic cases now one leading case which is pending in um, indore it relates to zoom developers case where the issue is that 26 fi rs have been lodged by cbi in bombay but 
the complaint of prosecution is filed in uh, indore so how would you reconcile the bombay cases will have to travel to indore how will they travel who will commit those cases to a different state to a different court so this kind of anomaly a dichotomous situation is created and now there is a recent amendment to section 44 which says well whatever orders are passed in the case of a scheduled offence will have nothing to do with the uh, with the cases under pml and that it will not be construed as a joint trial well it may not be a joint trial there may be acquittal in scheduled offence yes still there can be conviction in pml but that's a different format but if the scheduled offence either it results in say a closure report a discharge or a finding that there are no proceeds of crime well then at this in this eventuality the question of continuing with the pml case may not arise now this issue was addressed recently by a sessions judge in uh, delhi and that judgment is taken to pending in uh, delhi high court in deepak talwar's case it's a very interesting debate and that issue is also subject so section 44 character and meaning that they are all interconnected intertwined so with this end in mind uh, well i would uh, just say that basically these are the main facets which are there which i have uh, touched so uh, before we go to the q and session one thing which has always been considered in the case of the advocate is how much standing you had and the lawyer is always seen arguing when was the last time you had made submissions while sitting <laughs> no that's a new guys i told you uh, that there are these video conferencing are teaching you new lessons apart from sitting and arguing the second aspect is today you can request your opponent's uh, uh, you know uh, mic to be put on mute because there is some kind of disturbance coming in please put him on mute i am unable to make my submission which we have to learn in the court room there is lot of uh, i would say interplay between the councils <laughs> so the so one issue we are learning <laughs> one issue mr tushar mehta had also written hmm. that in once the video conferencing comes how will you ask for a passover that's right <laughs> but those are being asked huh let me tell you yesterday i did a case and uh, twice it was passed over <laughs> in so even in video conferencing <laughs> before we come to the question answer session i am unmuting anurag anurag is a very dear friend of ours though we don't allow unmuting any time but he said that he has a special question to be asked sir can you hear me please come yes. sir hello hi sir hi sir how are you i am you, I, I am very good and i hope everybody is also safe at yeah. home yeah, very, very uh, apart apart from being a great uh, lawyer as i may say uh, mr choudhary is even a greater human being one uh, why i say so is that my, even my niece here is uh of mm-hmm. mr choudhary as he knows and yeah. he is also attending the session all right oh, sir oh, so i was i was yeah. very fortunate I, i was very fortunate to assist mr choudhary in one of the mm-hmm. very sensational cases which happened in chandigarh regarding ed if sir you may re- recall yeah. justice wasifdar and justice sandawalia db we were doing a matter together and uh, i would want to ask you two questions uh, i will frame them in uh, one aspect only is arrest a mandate under the enforcement directorate and pmla further if an fir is registered against an accused and an as an offshoot of that fir because there was money involved an ecir came into being can both these aspects run concurrently or not well uh, to answer your first aspect i already said that section 19 is a very unique provision it raises the threshold bar for arrest to an absolutely phenomenal dimensions it says that you cannot arrest unless you have uh, reached a conclusion that he is guilty now that yard stick is very high obviously the act did not contemplate arrest and in any case our jurisprudence says that alida kumari's famous case of constitution bench that arrest should be made as a as an exceptional step it should be the rarest of rare action so obviously act is a void under the act arrest arrest is only in uh, desired in uh, very very i would say extraordinary cases but uh, the second question that if uh, you are an accused in the fir 
Well, if you are an accused in the FIR, the, there are three aspects to it. A person, maybe I'll give you a small example quickly. So say Mr. X has duped somebody of a uh, Mr. Y of rupees 10 lakhs. And that the, out of that 10 lakhs, he say gives five lakhs to his employee as is say as an incentive or salary and the employee doesn't know well, what has happened and he deposits it in that account. The rest of the five lakhs, he gives three lakhs to one other person to show it as his legitimate income. And that third, second person knows, say Mr. Z, knows that Y has, uh, X has duped Y. Now there are three different formats. Mr. X is guilty of both the scheduled offense, the 420, which is a scheduled offense and the laundering. The Mr. Uh, y who's an innocent employee who has deposited the money, showing it to be his, his uh, uh, I mean, a, a kind of a, uh, what you call an incentive from his employer. He doesn't know any of the thing. Now that he's neither guilty of offense of uh, scheduled offense or money laundering. The third person who knows that uh, the acts had duped why, why? Now if he deposits money, he may not have committed the offense in the 420, but he's still guilty under the money laundering. So these are three different offshoots. This is just one example. There could be thousands of classic cases which are now live, which we can discuss. So this, there would be multiple facets. What exactly is your, uh, I mean, uh, very relating to the second aspect? Very well. I think so. I, 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 or maybe I can ask one more thing. Section 5 CRPC gives an overriding part to the special acts over the IPC. If I'm right in asking the question, I would you, how would you construe this uh, same, sir, in terms of an FIR being registered under IPC? and the PMLA and the ED Act running concurrently. So that's a unique combination. Unless there is an offense, which may be a scheduled offense under IPC or any other offense. And from that offense or criminal activity relating to that offense, some property or money is derived. There will be no proceeds of crime for the purpose of investigation under PMLA. So that's a totally different link. The investigations in the scheduled offense in an IPC offense with CRPC is applicable, has nothing to do with the investigation the under PMLA, except and to the extent that proceeds of time are generated. All right. Thank you so much for the education, sir. No, no I'm, education, I'm, brother. You are uh, much more fire uh, in your belly uh, than, uh, than me. Uh, I may be uh, not even an iota in front of all of you. Uh, 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 right. That's it. Sir, uh, one thing would be since some questions are quite long. If uh, the I can in case where the questions are long, yes. I, I will read the question, but I will also tell you the time so that for you also it will be facilitated. Yes. Like we are on Heman Shah's question that is posted at 658. In a case where scheduled offense is the offense related to an extortion, punishable under section 384 to 389, mm -hmm. and offenses relating to robbery and decoity, punishable under section 392 to 402, mm -hmm. have been made scheduled offenses. The mm. money slash ransoms will be the proceeds of the crime. Mm. Yes. So, yes. Uh, will be the proceeds of the crime and the complainant in spite of being a victim will also suffer the attachment proceedings. Yes, that's what I said. The law has to evolve. They cannot be. If it was his legitimate money, which is due, where is the question? The money has to be restored back to the claimant. So then there is a provision now introduced in Section 8 itself, if you will read, that if you have a legitimate interest in a property, you can claim it, even if it is uh, you know, confirmed. An attachment is confirmed or confiscation is ordered. Even then, you can have legitimate interest. You have to show your legitimate interest and you can claim it. That's a new provision, of course, 8, 8 of PML. Section, subsection 8, 8 of PML. That's a, a quite a new provision, and it is uh, in in the in that spirit only. So the legislature is also working on it. The government is working on it. These are rough edges which are being, I think, smoothened out. Uh, yes. Sandeep Dhawan, your old associate, mm -hmm. has posed a multiple question in a multiple manner. He thought that this is the pla best mm -hmm. platform to learn. So mm -hmm. I thought quite reading all those questions will be very difficult. So I have unmuted with Havan and with Havan can pose the question himself. Sir, good evening. How are you? Very well, sir. How about you? Good, good, good. I hope everybody is fine at home. Havan, you are not audible. Uh, am I audible now? 
Yeah. Speak loudly. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. You yes, have like to be more loud once you are coming from Mr. Chaudhary's office. <laughs> uh, question, like you have said that there is a 2019 amendment. You know, yes. Uh, seeking to introduce this uh, after deleting section 45 in view of the Supreme Court judgment. Mm -hmm. They said that offenses to be cognizable of some offenses and some offenses to be non-cognizable. Mm -hmm. And you have also discussed about section 50 of the act where mm -hmm. uh, an accused cannot self-incriminate him. Mm -hmm. So whether that amendment itself is ultra virus article 23 of the constitution. Because section mm -hmm. section 50, uh, how can I accused go to a officer, ED officer and make a statement under section 50, which is going to be used against him. Because uh, amendment says that it is cognizable and in view of CRPC, as I told you, as I told you, the, uh, my understanding that this issue is subjudice. What is subjudice? You must know. Whether the offense is cognizable or non-cognizable was subjudice, already subjudice. When the government has now brought in an amendment that all offenses under the Act shall be construed always to be cognizable. So the government's understanding today is they have explained it, that the offenses are only cognizable according to them. So the question was that question pending before the court would be now, if the offense is cognizable, let's assume that the government is correct. Then if in a cognizable offense, they have to necessarily register a case that ECIR today is a secret document. It is not in public domain. So once it becomes in public domain, it is copy sent under 157 CRPC to the court. They will have to maintain a case diary under 172 CRPC, which is paginated volume wise, they will have to produce the case diary if they arrest someone under 167 CRPC. You become an accused the moment ECIR is registered. And if ECIR is registered, you become an accused, then what will happen to section 50, where there is an obligation to state truth, which impinges upon article 23, clause 3 of article 20, the right to remain silent. So you are right, there will be dichotomy. But in those cases, or until that time, that the questions which are being asked to you, are not self-incriminatory in nature. They do not subject to you to a criminal charge. You are still bound to state the truth. That is the realm of even Section 161 CRPC. Let's not forget that. You are always bound to state the truth before an investigating agency. It is only whether those aspects which subject you to a criminal charge can be asked or you can be compelled to disclose that. That is the whole test. So you are right to an extent. It requires interpretation, I would say. So my second question, just relating to the first question, can then we challenge ECIR in the High Court seeking quashing of the ECIR that it has not been reported to the magistrate within a period of 24 hours in view of the amendment? Of That's the what I said, that matter is subjudice. According to the understanding of the Enforcement Directorate, they are not supposed to register a case. They are not supposed to follow principles of CRPC. They do not follow it. So that is the whole debate. As I said, if you read just the Raj, uh, very high court judgment in Raj Bhushan Dikshit, it is self-explanatory. The matter is very vividly elaborated there. The issue has now traveled to the Supreme Court. Answer and the judgment is not stable. Answer in case of non-cognizable offense, whether the ED can investigate without the authority of the magistrate, like they are doing. Right. In a... So same way, same argument will prevail. If our contention, I mean, our, I say that I'm one of the counsels who are raising this contention, that if the Originally, there was something deleted in 2005 that every offense will be cognizable is deleted, then obviously they are non-cognizable. And for non-cognizable offense, you cannot start investigation without order of a magistrate. And sir, uh, one point... Sir, I if you have Mr. Chaudhary's number directly, we have a large number no, of no, questions. Sir, uh, yes, I sir. am asking questions just for others also. No, no, everybody would be asking questions because we would be running short of only, time. Only, only can I ask a question, one, please? Last one second, one second, if Mr. Chatras, you can give me. No, you can do. Sir, uh, if somebody money is not tainted at all, though it has been like, you know, in uh, we earn money and we show something to the income tax and something not to the income tax and that becomes a tainted money or like other people who earn money, but they do not show that money and whether that becomes a tainted money in so far as PMLA is concerned? Very pertinent question for especially for those who are not in the legal field. It's a very, very eloquent question. 
So there is no money laundering is a criminal offense under Section 3. Money laundering is not a loose term in our country. It's a serious offense under Section 3. That is money laundering definition itself is an offense. So if somebody has legitimately earned the money, but does not put it into the system, does not show it, say, for example, a doctor has taken money from his patient for legitimate, say, as his OPD fees, but is not depositing in his bank account. It may be anything, but he's not committing any offense. It's maybe an income tax violation, which is not a scheduled offense. So if there is not no scheduled offense, there is no criminal activity from which he's generating that proceeds. So it can never be. That money doesn't become tainted within the purview of Money Laundering Act. It has to be a criminal activity relating to an offense, which is part of the schedule under the PMLA, which will make it um, money laundering. It's a very technical legal term. It's not to be loosely used. So every money in your hand and unaccounted cash in your hand is not money laundering. It can never be. It is not subject matter of attachment. If you can show that this is my earning <coughs> from a legitimate source, but yes, I may not have put it into the system, it is not an offense of money laundering at all. It can never be. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Chatter. Oh, no, uh, so, Matt Council, you can also put a question directly because your question is also very long. But posted one question because we have just been flurried with so many questions. And uh, we sir, very good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful session. Uh, Hello, <laughs> in a short span of 45-50 minutes, you could give, give a crisp idea. Mm -hmm. I am also qualified chartered accountant besides being a lawyer. Wonderful. And on a public platform, I can admit that I've heard a lot of CAs, but then your, uh, your discussion was really wonderful. Just one question, sir, that do you feel the amendments in the act, they are draconian, the authorities are not well versed with the procedural aspects, and if there is an interplay of this act with income tax and Benami law, black money law, and there is tax terrorism prevailing in the country. Accordingly, as legal as tax practitioners, how can we safeguard our clients today? Uh, well, uh, brother, since you are also a lawyer, then I must uh, again reiterate that we are all passing through a stage of evolution so far as money laundering is concerned. I would not use the word draconian here, but I can definitely tell you that a bad implementation of, even if the provision is enacted with the most sacrosanct intention, if it is badly implemented, it will definitely become draconian. And uh, that has to be avoided, that, ha that, that there is no I would say knowing abuse has to be prevented. But yes, there are numerous amendments which have led to chaos and confusion. It is only adding fuel to the fire. There is a raging debate in the country. All these matters are subjudice. We'll soon have uh, judgments over each and every aspect. There may be some kind of uniformity in the country. And there At is a understanding, uniformity in understanding, I would say. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there is a dichotomy on the insolvency side also. On the Absolutely. That issue is... Uh, very recently, it has been taken to the Supreme Court. The, uh, the NCLAD has held that uh, IBC prevails over PMLA. But then, as I said, the matter is taken to the Supreme Court. So let's await the, those verdicts and let's hope that we soon get uh, resolution of all these uh, crucial aspects. What, what advice would you give, give us young advocates or practitioners for, for our clients or uh, generally uh, in such kind of a scenario? See, I can only understand that each and every word in an enactment. There are so, two. Georgie, sir, we will come, come uh, to the last session. We will have five minutes of the wrap up. How, how to okay. become a good lawyer? First, okay. let's complete the Q and A session right. okay. because everybody knows the format that we will always ask a good uh, who is a keynote speaker to come out. What is his advice? We will come to that question, Sumit. Your mm -hmm. question has been well taken. Thank you, Chaturji. Thank you. So I'm just. Coming. So at 7.2, uh, pr uh, pr Pradeep asks, PMLA being a case with seven years of punishment, should pre-summoning evidence be not led? Hello? See, there's a uh, section 44, 1B contemplates that cognizance would be taken on the basis of a complaint, a complaint. And second proviso to section 45 of PMLA. So section 44 and second proviso to section 45 say that cognizance will be taken only on the basis of a complaint. 
So when the complaint is filed, then pre-summoning evidence can always be dispensed with under Section 200 CRPC if it is a case of a public servant. That 200 CRPC Chapter 15 itself provides. So I would read it, though I am one with the thought process that all modalities of a complaint as contemplated under CRPC, whether Section 2D or Section 200 onwards will have to be followed. But still, I think to that extent that pre-summoning evidence is required or not, well, I don't think it will be required because of the exception carved out in Section 200 CRPC. Abhishek says, could you clarify the provisions of Section 44 and the concept of joint trial of the money laundering offence and the predicate offence? Also, an acquittal in the predicate offence would not lead to the cessation of the PML Act. That question is posed at 79. Yes, it's a very interesting question. And as I said, that Supreme Court in Nikesh Sarajan Shah's case, at least in two different places, if I'm correct, then if you read SCC citation, para 13 and para 31, in both these two, at least in two different places, they said that the major, uh, 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 the major objective of section 44 is that both offenses, which is the scheduled offense and the offense in the PMLA has to be tried. I would not say together, but I would, and I would not say Jointly, but I would say we have tried simultaneously by the same court, which is the special court under PMLA. And obviously, I further interpret that the objective was that the proceeds of crime have to be identified by the predicate agency. And the laundering thereof is the scope of the invest enforcement directive. But unfortunately, as I said, in many cases, there are live examples. When there are, now there is one huge uh, scam in Punjab, I may not like to name the case, it's still at an nascent state, where the investigating agency, which is Vigilance Bureau of Punjab, has found that no offence is committed, and they have found a, found a, filed a closure report. But in the same case, the Enforcement Directorate has launched a prosecution complaint, filed a prosecution complaint in the PML. So how will those two trials ever take place? They will never be. Can a single trial in the PML take place? Well, yes, but only in those circumstances where maybe in different format, a scheduled offence trial could not be held. Accused had died, or accused was not available, whereas in PMLA case, other accused are available. It could be different circumstances. But the contemplation of the Act definitely is that they have to be tried but, uh, by the same court and together. And yes, whether you are acquitted in PMLA, in scheduled offence would lead to PMLA closure, well, I have a different take on that. I use three words very carefully. If there is a closure report, in the main offence, that no offence took place. If there is a discharge, that no offence took place, uh, or there is no proceeds of obviously no proceeds of crime. Third, in the scheduled offence, acquittal take place on the ground that there is no proceeds of crime. Then, in all these three eventualities, PMLA proceeding will close. But assuming PMLA in the scheduled offence case, acquittal takes place on the ground of technicality. But proceeds of crime are still there. PMLA case may still continue. So we don't have that binding nature effect, maybe. Now, these are all myriad situations. That simpliciter acquittal would lead to simpliciter acquittal in PMLA. That may not be the position. But yes, without the format of establishment of proceeds of crime in a foundational offense, the offense under the, uh, the PMLA cannot continue. That much is a deliberation. You read that judgment in that, uh, I would say, Sessions Court judgment. Uh, of a very, uh, I, I, that, though that may not be technically a precedent, but it is pending before Delhi High Court in Deepak Talwar's case. So probably uh, one of uh, the briefing councils, uh, which anybody is interested, will give the details. That's a very interesting debate. But assuming in a scheduled offence, acquittal takes place because, uh, say, you are in, in, uh, uh, in, you have implicated a wrong accused by a wrong name, and he demonstrates that I am not that person, but still there are proceeds of crime existing. Or that person is an absconder. Against him, proclamation is issued there. But in money laundering, it is found that others were involved. Why can't they be prosecuted and tried? Maybe different kind of a thing. So the questions are just pouring in. But I will just take last question uh, of Sarman because that was posted first. As we say, like KBC, fastest finger first. Uh, whosoever posed the question after 640, we have taken the questions as per seniority, mm -hmm. as per number. Mm -hmm. What will be the fate of attachment prosecution under PMLA? If the predicate offence is compounded or the offender is discharged or acquitted? Yes, that's also another interesting area of debate. So what will happen to the, I don't think many compoundable cases 
would come across, but you can say under 482, if the High Court chooses to exercise its powers and say that, well, uh, the matter is resolved. Now, those are, I would say, evolutionary state will depend on the facts of each case. There would be innocent cases of, uh, say, difference between two individuals, and there may be harsh cases. And in Nikhil Merchant's case in Supreme Court, the proceedings were quashed. Then there were uh, a settlement even with the bank, I think. That was a case of a, maybe a, a, a dispute with the bank, a 420, etc. case or a Bodhiri case was this. There is a case of Sanjay Bandari of Delhi High Court also, a leading judgment on the subject where Supreme Court, uh, Delhi High Court allowed proceedings to be quashed when uh, in, even in an offense under 420 or 467 involving several courts, a compromise had taken place and bank was uh, the, the settlement took place. Now, what will happen in those cases to PMLA? Today, I have a different take altogether. Banks are always already at loggerheads with the enforcement directorate. They are saying we have a supervisory claim. We have a right to realize our, uh, uh, these are our assets mortgage to us. We should be able to realize them. IBC, the financial creditors like banks, etc., are claiming we should be given right under the resolution process. So these are different times. We will await the verdicts of the Supreme Court on these issues. So, uh, since questions were there, but we are running short of time, we will request you that you will have to come again on this platform. Let's, uh, the amount of, you would have seen that, I do not know whether you would, when you were taking the session, because last large number of messages I have been receiving on the WhatsApp also, kindly ask uh, Vikram Chaudhary ji to come again. So that without your giving consent, I have consented that since I am the drafting council that you will come again. So, so kind. That's a, I'm always a, a privilege that I have. And uh, uh, I must uh, say one last thing, which was... So last very, thing, last thing will come later on, a five minute wrap up. How to build a name, how to come well in this uh, department, uh, uh, establish the name within the profession, how to create a name. You were in Chandigarh, you created a name. You went shifted to Delhi, you have created a name. In Mumbai, you go, you say this. I'm just reminded, they say that where there is a law, there is a flaw. And where there is a flaw, there has to be lawyer. Probably in PMLA, I find that you, you could be the answer to that. <laughs> no, no. We are just evolving, brother. So kind of you. You are so very generous in your compliments to me. But I must say, uh, I learned something from a very senior man very recently and two courts and those are in uh, colloquial Urdu. So, it's a very good couplet. Hai. She is a nukta. Nukta is a, a dot in Urdu, a simple dot. And uh, Mehram is somebody who is very affectionate to you, uh, beloved. And Mujrim, we all know. So, it is a nukta ke hair fair name. हमें महरम से मुजरिम बना दिया। So अनुक्ता, which if the dot is put in on top and bottom, it changes the meaning. From a beloved, you become an accused or a sinner. So the beauty lies, the God lies in details, and these are all commas and dots that we look at in each sections. And uh, those sections, if we read them properly, if we do it well, we get food for thought, and we tend to bring it within the uh, you know purview of the courts. That's how the law has evolved. And I know people who have been briefing me. I know lawyers who have been coming. I am seeing lawyers who are arguing. They are far ahead of uh, me. They are 100 paces ahead. There is a lot of fire in their belly. And the only way to success, I would believe, is to look into the details. Nowhere else. Yeah. So taking cue from what you are saying, I am also reminded that what the meaning of comma, etc. would be uh, said, though it is again in Hindi. It says, Roko mat jane do. Roko mat jane do. The entire meaning and expression changes just to come from here to there. Well said. Huh? Uh, huh? So, Karthik, another a very established lawyer at a young age, I'm asking him to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of us. And though already we have stated that, and you have acceded to our request that we will bring you back to this platform beyond law, again, says that it is a pleasure with working with you. And another thing before Karthik says, we have two sessions tomorrow. In the morning, we will be having Supreme, uh, retired Supreme Court just, uh, Justice Korean Joseph along with Justice Kanan. They will speak on arbitration, mediation, and online disputes. In the evening, we will have a chartered accountant, Mr. T.N. Singla, along with Mr. Rakesh Gupta. He's a former ITAT member. They will speak on how the lawyer or any other person can invest and save income tax because we are all 
catering this platform is basically catering to the young students young lawyers primarily though we have lawyers from all uh, walks of life over to you kartike kartik 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 Karthik, sir, you are muted. Yeah. Hello, is it audible? Yeah, you can. We can hear you. Yeah. Is mute. Karthik, Karthik, you would have to come closer to the mic. Hello, is it better now? No, it's better. Good evening, sir. Hello, how are you, Karthik? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing the finest nuances of one of the most technical laws. And we are privileged to hear it from the person who I feel is an authority on this subject in this country. Mm -hmm. And, sir, as you just said, that this is a historical evolution of PMLA. One thing is for sure, it will not be complete without you, sir. We look forward, sir, for another session with you. And that's what everybody is suggesting on the chat window also. And, sir, We'll be looking forward for much more to learn from you for all times to come, including some day, somewhere on this forum again and again. Thank oh, you so my, much, sir. My privilege. My privilege. And I wish CLC and all of you a huge success. You are doing a human service to the entire legal fraternity and, of course, to the society at large. My all good wishes to all of you. So before we part, uh, Mr. Sethi from your team uh, has done a wonderful job. Uh, just a word of praise from you because he's a... See, uh, student of law working under your tutelage. See, well, uh, I must uh, say, uh, tell all of you that if there is an iota of uh, what you call a success in material terms, iota of it, I have nothing to do with it. It's my team. And my team is like my family. I have been blessed to have a brilliant team right from the day when I joined practice. Until today, my team is like uh, I think they are, um, they are, uh, they never get tired. They are super people, day and night working on every proposition. They have a lot of fire in their belly. And 99% of the things that I've said, well, I'm just a mouthpiece and it's their research. I owe a lot to them. Each one of them, Harshit is one of the most brilliant, uh, I would say, lawyers who are, uh, uh, whom at least I know of. Uh uh, Gagan, could you just uh, remove the screen share? We, uh, we are not able to see uh, Mr. Vikram Chaudhary in the right perspective. Gagan? So, uh, we are parting and with the promise that we are meeting again. Just for the friends who have joined us, you can catch up us on the Facebook page, Beyond Law CLC, as well as on Instagram. Otherwise, you can join the WhatsApp group, which has been posted in the chat box. Stay blessed, stay at home. And uh, Chaudhary sir, it's, it was a wonderful experience. Everybody has uh, yeah. actually been enriched. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The lockdown has unlocked many things in our minds. So kind of. Very Thank good. Thank you, sir.